I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor George Tafaris, who's a neurologist doing Parkinson's and also research on a blood-based test to predict Parkinson's. Thank you, Michelle. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and see so many of you, including people, come to my clinic. So it's a great opportunity to now tell you a little bit about what we do when we are not actually in the clinic, uh, um, uh, in the lab. So we had a lot from Laura why we need a biomarker. There's a, a major need in this. Uh, the focus of this work that we do is to try to essentially predict who is going to get Parkinson's before they come to the clinic, before you come to our clinic with the symptoms. And this is important because we know that Parkinson's, as you, as you experience yourself, start for, us, uh, for decades sometimes with the uh, constipation, the smell problem, the sleep disturbance we heard, uh, before actual tremor and stiffness and gait problems uh, present to the clinic, let's say here. So um, during that time, there's progressive loss of brain cells. And we want to find people here in this phase so that when we have disease-modifying therapies, such as exenatide, the antibody therapies we're testing with some of you, et cetera, we could actually slow that process and, prevent, and, and, and sort of uh, slow the essentially cumulative disability. Because unlike cancer, where you need to kill every single cell to cure someone, I think that if you slow down the disease here, even by 10, 15%, 20%, I think it's going to have a huge impact in, in the quality of life years down the line. So we're not there yet because we don't have the, 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 the disease-modifying therapies in the clinic, but you heard before about this coming through uh, clinical trials, and therefore we need to be prepared to screen like we screen for cancer now, with a PSA for a prostate, with an X-ray of the breast for a breast cancer, for example. We need to be able to do that for Parkinson's one day. So this is what I'm interested in. Now, uh, to do this, we need to come up with uh, some sort of rational approach which builds on our understanding of the molecular changes in the brain of patients, or people with Parkinson's. And, 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 and we know that Parkinson's is multifactorial, it's a very complex disease, but it's a key protein that Laura mentioned before, and I don't need perhaps to go in su uh, such detail, is alpha-synuclein. And this is a protein that uh, accumulates in the brain. This is a, a dopamine-producing nerve cell and has this sort of clump of alpha-synuclein, what Laura mentioned, the Lewy body. Um, that arises from a kind of a process where about alpha-synuclein is normally uh, physiological. Uh, it's shown here in the same blue. And what happens is that it sort of misfolds. It sort of changes conformation to something that is uh, not physiological, let's say here in, in red. And what that red sort of version of cytokine does triggers a conversion of the blue one into more red, which then assembles and forms these sort of clumps. And that process, somewhere along this line, I think, kills the cell or damages the cell substantially and also evolves or perhaps spreads between connected neurons. We don't know that for sure. And there's a lot of evidence for that. I'm just showing one of our uh, papers here where we use completely sort of a, a, a person sort of centric, uh, Parkinson centric approach where we, am uh, sorry, uh, we amplified sort of these sort of fibrils that I mentioned here from in the test tube and then added them on stem cell derived neurons from people with Parkinson's with mutations and we can re recapitulate in, in, in a dish in a, in a human neuron that Lewy body and what we observe in the dish is that as the aggregates accumulate within these cells so that they start to die. So that, that's one evidence to show that synuclein and its conversion to that misfolded form is quite key. So the next question is quite important. How is synuclein handled in the brain cells? So if synuclein is so toxic and can easily convert to something that is damaging, surely the, the brain has evolved and other cells uh, and other places where synuclein is present must have evolved ways to handle it. So we spent a lot of time in the lab to work out how synuclein is handled inside cells. I don't have time to go through the details, but just I want to explain briefly, because it's relevant to the biomarker, that synuclein, what we found, we have sort of data coming up, uh, oops, this doesn't work. So uh, um, uh, to show that uh, alpha synuclein here, when it's not wanted, this uh, sort of uh, 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 green sort of uh, line here, is uh, linked to uh, a chain of molecules shown here in uh, yellow, which is called the ubiquitin chain, and that targets a protein for destruction through these organelles inside cells, which are called endosomes, which fuse with lysosomes. Now, lysosomes are 
sort of digestive bags inside cells that chew up sort of unwanted proteins such as cyanucleins. So we know that in Parkinson's, these lysosomes don't work very well. So we reason, having established that pathway, is that under conditions which are no longer optimal, the cell is perhaps releasing cyanucleins outside in these nanoparticles here, which are derived from these sort of endosomes which are found inside the cells. And we call those extracellular vesicles or extracellular nanoparticles. And every cell releases those particles, including brain cells, and there is a way to find them because they have on their surface uh, uh, the markers that tell us where they came from. So brain cells release uh, vesicles that have brain proteins on their surface. So if we use an antibody to capture those vesicles in the blood, from the blood, then we could perhaps measure that synuclein that is coming originally from the brain cells or nerve cells that are found also inside and outside the brain. So just to, to put that again in a, in a simplified form, so here in this side is the brain. Laura mentioned the spinal fluid. Let's imagine it's here in white. So these vesicles that I mentioned that go uh, uh, out when synuclein perhaps is not needed have a marker on them which says it's coming from the brain. They get into the blood. And what we're trying to do in our lab, we have done, is to capture those vesicles from the blood. And the challenge there is most of synuclein actually in the blood is free and it's coming from the periphery, from non-neuronal cells, non-brain cells. So therefore it's quite key to develop the right method of capturing that minority of particles that are floating around in our blood that are coming from brain. So I'm not going to go into the details of the method, but I'm going to show you some of the results. First we were able to show that in, uh, in Parkinson's essentially using uh, the cohort here in Oxford uh, and, and, and cohorts from Italy and Germany because it's very important to validate these things across different populations. But uh, what you see here in red are individuals with Parkinson's, including some of you perhaps sitting here in the audience, where we showed that indeed if we captured these nanoparticles and measure synuclein, it's higher in Parkinson's compared to healthy controls. And when we use this um, sort of cutoff, where is the separation line, and apply to the German and Italian courts, we find the same thing. So we were able to show that with this blood test, there is a, a kind of consistent performance, what we call area under the curve, which essentially roughly means the probability of separating a, someone with a positive test uh, from someone with a negative test. And it's about 86%, which is roughly about what the clinician can do uh, in the clinic in their confidence of diagnosing Parkinson's. So it's not that bad. So perhaps not that useful there, but it's actually a pretty good test. Uh, what, what has been particularly useful is to separate people with Parkinson's from people with more Parkinson-like conditions who can be more aggressive. We heard about MSA from Laura. Laura mentioned before that in MSA we have the buildup of synuclein in the the glial cells around the brain and the nerve cells, whereas in Parkinson's we have the Lewy bodies inside the nerve cells. So I mentioned that we measure nerve cell derived vesicles. So it's interesting that in MSA, where the nerve cell derived vesicles don't have synuclein because synuclein is building in the non neuronal cells. So we can actually use this blood test to separate uh, PD from MSA with a almost 100% confidence, which is quite important because MSA is a much more aggressive disease. So one would like to know that they really don't have MSA. They have Parkinson's uh, because it has implications for prognosis and also when eventually come to stratify, as we say, people for clinical trials. We can separate Parkinson's from people who have four repeat tauopathies some other kind of conditions that can be Parkinson's quite well. So here is a, a, a practical use of this test perhaps in the clinic. But what I'm most excited about, and I want to mention over the next few minutes, is our efforts to find people before they develop Parkinson's. This is a, a, a work, in a my group spearheaded by Cheng and Victor, uh, and involved essentially the, the Oxford Discovery cohort here, um, cohorts from Germany, and also the PPMI you heard before, which is the Michael J. Fox funded international cohort from Europe, Israel, and the US. So uh, it's a kind of thorough uh, investigation where we use people with Ramsley behavior disorder who have very high risk of uh, progr uh, progressing to Parkinson's, about 6.3% per year. And also the PBMI has people with different, uh, different risks. So um, again, what you can see here in the Oxford group, we can see in red here individuals with RBD 
have high synuclein uh, in their blood using the tests I mentioned compared to the controls. When we define a threshold that separates these two groups and apply it to the German group, here is the blue line here, we can actually see a very consistent separation. This is quite striking. I think the area under the curve is pretty good. It's 85 to 90 percent. But what was even more exciting is that when we apply the same threshold we have found here, and you can see the, the line here, uh, the blue line, uh, and we can separate individuals from a PBMI cohort who have a high probability of developing Parkinson's from those with very low probability, probability less than 5 percent, which is essentially close to normal, with an area under the curve of 83%, which is pretty remarkable. Essentially, you can find those who have a very high risk from those with low risk. And here are the Parkinson's individuals who are similar to those at high risk. So essentially, the blood test is changing before people develop Parkinson's. And here is, if we take all these people I mentioned, uh, it's about 400 individuals and at, at variable risk and classify them into those what we call a positive likelihood a ratio of having PD, that would mean more than 80% probability of, of developing uh, Parkinson's from uh, uh, those who have a low prob probability, and here are the healthy controls, and these are uh, 200 or so of them. You can see that we can separate those uh, with an area under the curve of, uh, of 90%. So and that's a pretty remarkable uh, finding. All that is done, of course, blinded. And also what that means is to find these individuals here and classify them in this way requires labor-intensive clinical in, uh, examinations, whereas with a single blood test we can perhaps achieve the same as uh, detailed clinical assessments. So um, we're quite excited about this uh, result. Um, I'm, I'm just showing this um, uh, here to, sh to say that we also had a subgroup that had a DAT scan. You mentioned, we mentioned before that DAT scan is a way of measuring the loss of dopamine cells in life uh, in people with Parkinson's and, and other conditions. And here, uh, usually, uh, it's a normal. Let me see whether this works. Now. Yeah, so this is a normal DAT scan with a kind of comma shaped appearance. Here is a Parkinson's DAT scan with the dots because the, the nerve cells start to die. So those who have a DAT scan, which means uh, these are not people with Parkinson's, these are people at risk with an abnormal test, meaning they're about to develop Parkinson's. They have a, the test was higher than those with a negative DAT scan, which means they haven't yet, uh, we have not, not yet detected in life the loss of dopamine uh, cells. So those are separated from the healthy controls with an area under the curve of 80% probability of getting it right, whereas the, the intermediate one slightly lower. But the important point of this analysis is that um, the blood test actually can find individuals before even the DAT scan becomes positive. And that's quite important. Is that the blood test changes before we can detect the nerve cells dying by, by imaging. And just um, uh, kind of a few last things. From all those 400 people that develop, are, are, were at risk of having Parkinson's and we studied in this um, uh, investigation, about 40 develop Parkinson's or related disorders. So we're able to go back and say, what was the blood test like one to seven years before they had uh, Parkinson's? And you can see that our blood test correctly identifies about 8% of those who are going on to develop Parkinson's, which I think is quite remarkable. Whereas one individual that developed Alzheimer's disease was below the cutoff line here. So uh, that's promising. And what is also interesting, just to finish off, is that there is a weak correlation, but it's a correlation, in the sense that the higher the amount of cyanuclein in the blood test, the longer it takes to develop Parkinson's. Um, and, and there here it is, for those who have the data, uh, kind of an inverse correlation between the spinal fluid synuclein and the blood test synuclein. In other words, the more you release outside, the less is in the fluid around the brain, which suggests that perhaps this blood test, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a way of the brain cells to rid themselves of uh, excess synuclein that is building up which is what we're capturing and measuring in the blood. So um, what we are also doing is developing the technology to make this scalable and cheap enough to be um, a, a, a screening test. It's perhaps one day the same way that uh, you measure glucose for diabetics with a simple pinprick. 
Here is what I, the data I showed you involve a kind of a laboratory-based assessments uh, where we, we sort of isolate the vesicles, we do all these things manually. Here with this chip, we can do all this with a, a small amount of blood uh, or serum, 50 microliters within 30 minutes. Eventually we inject the serum, mix with these beads that capture the vesicles, we agitate them with magnets and then we sort of measure this and, and we were able to show similar results using this sort of chip with what I've shown you before. So, so we're getting towards uh, uh, essentially a, 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 diagnose, a, a screening test that perhaps could be used to identify and stratify those that will eventually benefit from precision therapies that were mentioned earlier, uh, targeting alpha synuclein. So I hope I have a couple of minutes because obviously what we do is has to be guided by you. So I wanted to actually ask you to raise your hand for a couple of questions just to see whether we, we're doing the right thing or not, maybe. Um, so having heard what I said to you, do you think it would be a useful to have a blood test to confirm the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease? Would anyone like to have that as an option? Majority, okay. And uh, if we had a screening test like the one I showed you that can tell you you will get Parkinson's, would you have that test if we had therapies to slow down the disease? Yeah. 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 I guess, yes, thank you. So the question is would you take it if we now that we don't have therapies? <laughs> Some of them. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's quite useful to know. So on that note, I want to thank my, uh, thank you my group, especially Victor, he's on, in the audience, I think behind there, and Cheng, who went on to become assistant professor himself back in China, uh, uh, our funders, and of course I want to thank all of you who donate your samples and your time to, to enable this research, and I hope I have convinced you today that we're getting somewhere with all that uh, contribution. Thank you very much.